The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You are going to hear a conversation between Don and a rental agent. He hopes that his apartment problems can be solved. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. We shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. I am a rental agency. How can I help? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about some problems I'm having with my apartment. Yes, of course. If I can just get a few details first. What's your name? Don Chester. How do you spell that? C-H-E-S-T-E-R OK. And the address? Apartment 4, 18 Ruby Lane. Ruby Lane. And that's in? In Newbridge. Oh, yes. I know the one. Could I ask how long is the lease? It's for a year. And you moved in on? Last week. On 24th May. Good. Thanks. Now, what are the problems you found? Well, nothing too serious, you know, but a few things that have been building up over a few days. Yes, of course. Well, the first thing is the fridge. The seal on the door is decayed, and we have a small child and need to keep milk cool, so we need to get that done straight away. OK, that's the fridge for immediate repair. And then there's a little problem with the gas water heater. Uh-huh. The switch is broken. Right. It's not serious, and we can still use it. But if you can send somebody over in the next couple of weeks or so, that'd be great. OK, I've got that. Then we're worried about the front windows. Are they broken? No, but there are no blinds on them. And, you know, with privacy these days. And when would you like those done? Oh, it's not really urgent. But there are only thin curtains on the windows and people are walking past. Yes, we'll have those done for you by next week. Don't worry. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. There are only thin curtains on the windows, and people are walking past. Yes. We'll have those done for you by next week. Don't worry. And then there's the front door lock. It's getting quite annoying. It often jams, and we sometimes have to fiddle with it for minutes before we can get in the apartment. I'd really like to get that fixed up right away. That's no problem. And then the last thing is the shower curtain. It's torn. Oh, right. We can get a new one and have it to you in the next week, if that's all right with you. Yes, that's OK. Anything else? No, that's all. OK, fine. What we'll do now is get someone over to you this afternoon if you're home. Well, I'll be out for a short while. OK. Tell us your preferred times. Well, the best time is about two o'clock. I'd have to check that with him. And if he can't get there then, what would be your second preference? Oh, any time up to 6pm would be fine. OK, I've got that. Great. Thanks very much. That's fine. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. 
I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So, a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute 
to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Okay, can you quieten down, please? Now, today I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right? Can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore which currency you're going to be operating in. Okay. Now, the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So, I want you to suppose that you have one hundred pounds. That you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together. But before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible, because then I want you to get together. We can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go round the other students and attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over eighty, but just the twenty-nine principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming, but as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation. Of one particular aspect, I was going to give you a choice, 
But I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th, then it's the holidays until January the 6th, so I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a student giving a presentation about some ways of dealing with the problems of urbanization and city growth. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, Adam's just been talking about some of the problems that have resulted from the rapid growth of cities in the last hundred years. Things like housing, sanitation, crime and so on. For my presentation, I'd like to look at some examples of what cities are doing to try to solve some of these problems. As part of its Healthy City program, the World Health Organisation, the WHO, has come up with a set of criteria for a healthy city. The WHO says that, amongst other things, a healthy city must provide a clean environment which is also safe. It mustn't be dirty or dangerous for its inhabitants. As well as that, the WHO says a healthy city has got to be able to satisfy its inhabitants' basic needs. That's all its inhabitants, not just the rich ones or the ones with jobs, everyone who lives there. A third thing, a third criterion, is that it's got to have health services which can be used by all the inhabitants and which they can access easily. The final point's to do with local government. The WHO says this is something that the whole community should be involved in, not just a few powerful politicians or businessmen. So, a healthy city is not just a matter of avoiding illness, that sort of healthiness, it's the way that the whole city works together for the benefit of its population. OK, so what I'd like to do now is to look at some projects in different cities around the world where cities have tried to meet these criteria, to make their cities healthy ones. Right, the first project I'm going to discuss took place in Sri Lanka, and this project was called the Community Contract System. Its aim was to improve the places where the poorest section of the population lived, the squatter settlements. Basically, the problem was lack of infrastructure, things like drains, paths, wells for water and so on. So, a program was set in place to construct this infrastructure. But what was different about it was that the residents did this the people who actually lived there, not people from outside. And this meant that not only did the people end up with improved housing and infrastructure, but also because they had contracts with the community, it improved their chances from an economic point of view. So that's the way the lives of people in one urban environment were improved. The next project I'd like to discuss took place in the capital city of Mali in West Africa. This project involved setting up a cooperative to try to solve the problems of sanitation in the old central quarters of the city. One of the main problems was a lack of a system for garbage collection, which meant that there were a lot of insects and this was causing disease. 
And again, it's interesting to look at who was involved in dealing with this problem. In this case, the cooperative involved students who had graduated from secondary school in getting a system going. As well as that, the cooperative set up a campaign to educate the public about the importance of good sanitation through showing films and setting up discussion groups among the local people, especially women and adolescents. And the outcome was an increased environmental awareness, which led to changes in household behaviour as well as improved living conditions. Okay, the third project was in Egypt, just outside the capital, Cairo, which is a city that's grown very rapidly in the last few decades. This project was based in a women's centre in a poor area called Makatam. The aim of the project was to support girls, young women from the area from poor families. So these were women who had no education. They'd never been to school, so they were totally illiterate, and they had no chance of getting jobs. At the women's centre, they were shown how to sew and how to weave, and once they'd learned these skills, they were given the equipment, a sewing machine or a loom, so that they could make things to sell and had a chance of earning their own living. And this project has meant that these young women have greater status in the community. But as well as that, they can enjoy a better quality of life. So I don't think the problem is that cities are bad. This world and its cities have the resources to provide for the population that lives there. What it takes is a stronger will and a better distribution of resources. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. <laughs>